Of all the video game series that have made their mark on the industry, few have elicited as many disparate reactions as Grand Theft Auto. To some, the series is the apex of interactive media, the ultimate expression of virtual freedom and the cathartic chaos that this freedom can result in. To others, it's one of the biggest smoking guns behind all of the misanthropy and violence present in today's youth, in addition to being a vile and artless product in its own right. If there's one aspect that nearly everyone agrees on, it's that Grand Theft Auto is among the most successful properties in the history of its medium. In the two decades that it's graced consoles, handhelds, and PCs, the open world series has remained a fixture on most sales charts, with its most recent entry, Grand Theft Auto V, having generated more revenue by itself than most franchises managed to over their entire lifetime. To most gamers today, this thoroughness with which the series currently dominates the industry is as normal as Mario is Italian. Yet to those that have been paying attention to it since its inception, it's still a mighty impressive feat. For up until the late 2000s, a day didn't seem to go by where the series wasn't embroiled in some sort of scandal created by its most egregious detractors or its very own developers. This is the history of Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> what? Good to see you, men. Few aspects are as emblematic of Grand Theft Auto as its setting. While each of the open world series metropolises explore different time periods and motifs, almost all of them take place in an exaggerated yet earnest rendition of the United States, a Hollywood-esque interpretation of the land of the free where breakneck car chases and high-rolling debauchery permeate every city block. However, while a great deal of the research and development that goes into creating its vision of America currently takes place within the country's borders, this vision first took root well outside of them at a development studio in Dundee, Scotland named DMA Design. Founded in 1987 by David Jones, an enterprising young coder who aspired to make the slickest games his skills could muster, DMA got its start developing side-scrolling shooters and ports of Reflection Interactive's Shadow of the Beast before coming into its own with the release of Lemmings in 1991. A puzzle-based platformer in which the player guides groups of human-like critters through a host of obstacle-laden levels, Lemmings proved a gigantic hit, selling over 15 million copies and establishing DMA as a developer worthy of recognition almost overnight. The studio would go on to port their breakout title to seemingly every platform under the sun in the decade that would follow, as well as release a litany of sequels to it. Yet it would also continue to develop its share of original concepts, including Uniracers, a stunt-based racing game starring riderless unicycles, and a science fiction-themed role-playing game titled Hired Guns. All of these post-Lemmings projects presented their share of challenges throughout their creation, yet in the end, none proved as difficult to develop as Race and Chase. Originally conceived by DMA's chief creatives as a virtual version of Cops and Robbers, Race and Chase became better known for being a virtual checklist of problems throughout much of its development. Its engine crashed constantly, its cars handled poorly, and perhaps most significantly, it simply wasn't fun. Where previous car-based action games like APB brimmed with speed and a puerile sense of excitement, DMAs felt slow and bland. Its maps, which took players through the municipalities of Liberty City, Vice City, and San Andreas, stand-ins for New York, Miami, and San Francisco respectively, were all impressively detailed, with both people and cars alike moseying through their streets in a highly lifelike manner. But this level of detail amounted to it feeling more like a driving simulator than a high-octane action game. It was around this time that Jones and the rest of DMA Design became acquainted with Sam and Dan Hauser, London-born rebels with a passion for Def Jam recordings and the lifestyle its music typified the Hausers had both managed in their 20s to score themselves jobs at BMG, helping oversee the development and publication of various video games within the company's nascent technologies division, BMG Interactive. Both believed that the medium represented an exciting and overlooked part of pop culture, 
and were more than happy to be able to play a part in its proliferation. But it wasn't until DMA approached them with a demo of Race and Chase that they found a project to truly champion. While they were as disenchanted with its problems as its own creators, they both sensed that underneath its ugly exterior, DMA's driving title held considerable potential and agreed to help see it to release. For months afterward, DMA and the Housers struggled to try and turn Race and Chase into a game that all would be proud of, exchanging new builds and feedback on how to improve it on a frequent basis, yet failing all the while to figure out how to make it fun. Many within both parties began to fear that if things didn't turn around soon, their game would face the chopping block. Until one day, its design took a turn none had planned for. In a 2011 interview with Gama Sutra, Gary Penn, who at the time was serving as DMA's creative director, revealed that an unexpected programming error suddenly resulted in all of the game's police cars becoming increasingly aggressive, with them attempting to ram into the player instead of pulling them over. Everyone almost immediately fell in love with the chaos it resulted in, and quickly came to realize that it would be much more fun if they made its environments encourage this naturally. Restrictions were removed, objectives were twisted, and within a relatively short period of time, Race and Chase was transformed into a radically different experience, one in which running over pedestrians or hijacking their cars was valued over abiding by the rules of the road. What had previously been a game of cops and robbers was now a game of robbers and cops, a game that everyone agreed deserved a name that better reflected this change. Grand Theft Auto There was now just one last issue that needed to be dealt with before the game arrived on store shelves. It's marketing. Despite being set in America, Grand Theft Auto was to release in the United Kingdom first, and many within BMG were concerned that it was going to have an uphill battle to reach the masses if it wasn't advertised right. As much fun as it provided, its gameplay wasn't going to be to everyone's tastes, and its graphics were going to be a hard sell to players that had become enchanted by three-dimensional experiences like Super Mario 64 and Tomb Raider, which had blown up in popularity over the course of its development. As a result, in order to ensure that the game didn't go overlooked upon its release, BMG Interactive enlisted the services of Max Clifford. A tabloid mogul, Clifford had proved himself a mastermind many times prior in manipulating public opinion using outrageous headlines and sensationalism, usually with regards to matters involving celebrities or politicians. BMG hoped Clifford would be able to use this same chicanery to make Grand Theft Auto find itself onto the tips of everyone's tongues. And if anything, he exceeded their expectations. Within a matter of months, English lawmakers, executives, and parents were scrutinizing the game up and down, spurned by a carefully scripted media narrative orchestrated by Clifford into believing that its violence would utterly corrupt their nation's youth. Even though it wasn't out yet, seemingly everyone that became ensnared by its bluster and had a platform on which they could speak out found themselves condemning its existence as well as the minds behind it. When Grand Theft Auto was finally released on the PC in October of 1997, people who actually got their hands on it found much of this bluster to be more overblown than genuine. There was little dispute that the carnage it let one take part in was gloriously immoral, as well as far more depraved than what most other violent video games at the time allowed for. Yet the longer they cruised through its streets, the clearer it became that underlying all of this was a deeply immersive and rewarding action title one that was rivaled by few others in terms of how deeply it allowed players to manipulate its environments. Grand Theft Auto's violence was an important part of it, but it wasn't its essence. Its essence was its freedom. And while this freedom wasn't quite so strong that it fully distracted players from the repetitive nature of its missions or its dated graphical style, it all but ensured that most who tried out DMA's game had themselves a fun time. Shortly after Grand Theft Auto's initial release, BMG Interactive was purchased by Take-Two. Founded in 1993 by Ryan Brandt, Take-Two had risen to prominence in the middle of the decade with titles like Hell, a cyberpunk thriller, and Ripper. 
point-and-click adventure games prominent for featuring large casts of Hollywood actors, and had been using its clout in the years following to acquire as many video game distributors as it could muster. Its acquisition of BMG Interactive proved one of its most lucrative. In addition to giving it access to Grand Theft Auto's rights, which it subsequently used to publish said title on the Sony PlayStation, the purchase led to the Hausers and several other key BMG employees moving to its headquarters in New York and establishing Rockstar Games, a publishing label designed to foster more titles of Grand Theft Auto's nature. Rockstar Games would go on to use most of its manpower during its first year to slowly build up a portfolio of games and studios that it felt would serve this mission statement well, including the Ontario-based Game Tech Canada, which would subsequently be rebranded Rockstar Canada and put to work on an expansion to Grand Theft Auto. Yet it would also spend a healthy amount of resources aiding DMA design in the development of Grand Theft Auto 2. Upon entering production in mid-1998, the latter project had quickly morphed into a much more stressful and demanding affair than its predecessor. While all involved were excited to be able to take their series to the next level, their new overseers at Take-Two had mandated that they do so in a little over a year. Gone were the days of spending months tinkering slowly upon the original Grand Theft Auto's design until things accidentally fell into place. Everyone was now part of a corporate machine, and that machine needed to hit its deadlines. But before this project would come to fruition, DMA would release two games on the Nintendo 64 that, while not part of the Grand Theft Auto universe, were developed by several employees who would go on to play an integral role in the franchise's development in the future, and allowed DMA to test many features and systems that would eventually be folded into it. The first was Body Harvest, an action-adventure game in which players battled insectoid aliens across multiple time periods. In addition to featuring large biomes populated with houses, trees, and wandering townsfolk that one could freely explore, Body Harvest allowed players to commandeer a host of vehicles on their journey to trounce their otherworldly oppressors. The second was Space Station Silicon Valley, a 3D platformer in which players controlled a microchip capable of taking over the bodies of semi-robotic animals. Where Body Harvest's environments were wide and expansive, Silicon Valley's were fairly compact, closely resembling Super Mario 64's play spaces in terms of scope and layout. But also, much like Mario, they were hardly lacking in things to do. In a 2013 retrospective on Gama Sutra, Oba Fermai, one of Silicon Valley's programmers, would recall how the team pushed hard to ensure their platformer's world was rife with interactivity and encouraged players to experiment with all of its animals' unique mechanics. They wanted it to feel like a dynamic, living space, instead of just a series of puzzles designed to test one's intellect. And the end result of their efforts was a game that succeeded to a degree, in evoking this. Though neither Body Harvest nor Silicon Valley would go on to sell especially well, both would be considerably well received by critics, who by and large found them to be second to Nintendo's first party lineup in terms of quality. Unfortunately, reviews wouldn't be quite as glowing when Grand Theft Auto's next installments arrived in 1999. The first of these installments was Rockstar Canada's expansion to the original Grand Theft Auto. Titled London 1969, the expansion provided PlayStation and PC gamers in March with a stylish yet underwhelming romp through the titular British capital. Its metropolis, eager to set itself apart from DMA's American facsimiles, burst with all manner of English iconography and slang, as well as a host of references to era-appropriate media like James Bond and the Italian job. But underneath this fresh coat of paint, its gameplay remained largely identical to what the series' first outing had featured, with most of its missions forcing players to do the same road-tearing escapades they performed time and time before. And its graphical style, still more two-dimensional than three-dimensional, stood out even more sorely than it had in 1997. Remember, I'm the monkey and you're the cheese grater, so no messing around. After London 1969, Rockstar Canada released London 1961, a second, smaller expansion that was only made available as a freeware download on the PC. And after London 1961, DMA Design stepped back up to the plate with Grand Theft Auto 2 in October. 
Most of the same criticisms that pundits had levied at the first game's expansions quickly found their way into the discourse surrounding GTA 2, with many once more decrying its gameplay and graphics for being too similar for comfort to what its predecessor had offered. But even its most ardent detractors agreed that for as much as the sequel didn't attempt to reinvent the wheel, it certainly wasn't lacking in original ideas or improvements. Where the first Grand Theft Auto had featured a mostly linear campaign that took players through proxies of America's most prominent cities, GTA 2 cast players into the heart of a nameless metropolis known simply as Anywhere USA, and allowed them to freely accept missions from an eccentric collection of gangs, each of which would become more hostile towards the player depending on who they supported. GTA 2 also introduced side missions into the series, allowing players to earn extra cash by being a taxi, bus, or delivery truck driver if they so desired, in addition to revamping the artificial intelligence governing its pedestrians to be far more dynamic than before. Yet in the end, these changes simply weren't enough to make the public fall for Grand Theft Auto 2 as they had for 1. Though it wouldn't go down in history as a massive failure, DMA's sequel would fail, all the same, to eclipse its predecessor's heights, upsetting the studio's overseers at Rockstar and tripping up the series' previously steady momentum. Exacerbating GTA 2's disappointment further was that it came hot on the heels of David Jones's departure from DMA. After the release of Grand Theft Auto 1, the studio had gone through a revolving door of different owners. Dissatisfied with these turns, the direction in which the Housers were pushing Grand Theft Auto, and the lack of time he'd been given to develop the sequel, which he would later blame most of its problems on, Jones had decided to leave for greener pastures just as 2 was nearing the end of development, making the sequel's issues appear more ominous than they might have otherwise seemed once it was released. Jones would continue to remain active within the video game industry in the years that would follow, establishing multiple development studios near DMA Design's original headquarters, and, much later on, helping conceive the first game in the Crackdown series. Meanwhile, DMA would quickly set about course-correcting Grand Theft Auto under the guidance of both the Housers and a new team of creatives headed by Andrew Semple and Leslie Benzies, the latter of whom had previously served as Space Station Silicon Valley's lead programmer. It was apparent to all that they had taken the series' successfulness for granted with GTA 2, and going forward, they were going to need to offer an experience that broke far more boundaries if they wanted it to return to stardom. Fortunately, much of the team had known well before GTA 2's release how it was going to do so, by taking the series fully into 3D. Not only was it a direction that many within and outside the studio had been anticipating for some time, but also a direction that some of its competitors were already trying their hand at. Reflections Interactive's Driver, for example, had allowed players to cruise recklessly through three-dimensional approximations of cities like Miami and San Francisco upon its release in 1999. And its sequel, which would go on to release the following year, was getting ready to allow players to step out of their cars and explore their surroundings on foot. Thus, not wanting to see the rest of the industry pass it by, Rockstar forged a partnership with Sony to have what would become Grand Theft Auto 3 release exclusively on the PlayStation 2, and DMA set about bringing it into existence. The original Grand Theft Auto's Liberty City was matured into a fully polygonal environment. Lessons learned from Body Harvest and Silicon Valley on how to make fully polygonal environments engaging were applied to every single one of its streets, and the amount of choice players would have when taking on these streets was carefully balanced in order to ensure that they would also be able to tell a compelling, coherent story. In a retrospective interview with GameSpot in 2011, Dan Hauser would explain how coming off of Grand Theft Auto 2, the team felt that they had given players too much leeway in terms of letting them define their relationships with Anywhere USA's criminal organizations and made a game that was by consequence too lacking in story. As a result, not wanting 3 to suffer in the same way, they made a point of making sure its freedom always supported and worked in tandem with their narrative ambitions, instead of opposing them. Reconciling all of this forced DMA staff to perform numerous technological feats that had never been attempted before, 
as well as solve complex design problems that would make any other developer swoon in the span of just two years. Nevertheless, once GTA 3's release date started getting close, everyone involved in its production found themselves beset by a mixture of emotions. Both Rockstar and DMA believed that they had a truly great game on their hands, if not one of the greatest the medium had ever seen. But when they showed off their work at the 2001 Electronic Entertainment Expo, most of the show's attendees were more interested in State of Emergency, an over-the-top beat-em-up that Rockstar was also publishing, though not as personally invested in. Fear began to take hold that GTA 3 was fated to flop, and this fear only became further concentrated after the September 11th terrorist attacks devastated their digital metropolis's real-life counterpart prompting them to tone down the gratuitousness of some of the violence players could engage in and remove buildings that resembled the World Trade Center. When Grand Theft Auto 3 finally released in 2001, this fear was quickly proven to have been misplaced. Within a matter of weeks, 3 managed to climb to the top of both sales charts and hearts alike, becoming the best-selling game to grace the PlayStation 2 since the console's launch. Fans both new and old couldn't get enough of how much more freedom the threequel's additional dimension brought to the series, as well as how often enacting on this freedom felt as great as one hoped it to be. Whether one was jacking into cars with reckless abandon and driving them off the road, engaging in elaborate firefights using a variety of different armaments, or sitting back and listening to the game's frequently comical radio stations, there seemed no aspect to three that didn't feel, look, and sound great all at once. That it also told a solid and fairly well-paced story on top of all this was icing on the cake. The open-world genre was born, and people all over the globe couldn't stop raving about it. Though not all of this raving was positive. This is the nation's top-selling video game. The object? Kill as many people as you can, get as many stars as you can. Like with GTA 1 and 2 before it, many, both within and outside the industry, expressed mixed feelings about the level of violence players could engage in within 3's sandbox, concerned once more about what effect the games might have on developing minds. Yet none would go on to rally against it as passionately as Jack Thompson. A Florida attorney and activist, Thompson had spent the previous decade rallying against all manner of media that he felt glorified violence or sex before setting his sights almost exclusively on the video game industry. To him, no other industry presented more of a threat to the well-being of American society, and no series within this industry was more indicative of this threat than Grand Theft Auto. While Thompson would only walk onto the stage after the initial salvo of criticisms against three ran their course, he would proceed to become one of its most persistent denigrators using any platform he was given to espouse why he believed it was noxious and using incidents of gun-related violence where the perpetrator in question admitted to playing or even being inspired by Grand Theft Auto to justify his beliefs. No sooner had the dust settled around 3's release than DMA design was rebranded Rockstar North and its staff were put to work on a follow-up. Much in the same way that many had anticipated that the series' third entry would embrace 3D well before Grand Theft Auto II was completed, Sam Hauser had already set his mind on where he wanted to take 3's successor well before it was given the green light. 1980s Miami In addition to already being featured in the first Grand Theft Auto in the form of Vice City, Miami's beaches and palm trees would visually be an apt palate cleanser coming off of 3's concrete jungle. And thanks to media like Scarface and Miami Vice, there was no shortage of reference material on how to turn it into a crime-riddled wonderland if set during the decade in question. As development on what quickly became titled Grand Theft Auto Vice City entered into full swing, many more aspects of GTA 3 were deemed in need of an overhaul. Its streets needed to be filled with a livelier, more eccentric populace. Its cinematics needed to be far more polished and film-like. Its lighting system needed to be able to illuminate its neon-soaked streets with a far more expressive palette. And perhaps most importantly of all, its protagonist needed a voice. Previously, all of the Grand Theft Auto series' other protagonists had been silent, serving as receptacles upon which the player could imprint whatever personality they so wanted. But after watching players take earnestly to three story, the Housers realized that next step in their narrative ambitions would be achieved by making the series' protagonist start speaking. Where there had once been silence, 
there would now be the hot-tempered outburst of protagonist Tommy Rossetti, voiced by Ray Liotta of Goodfellas fame. Oh, we could try bribery. Bribery? Screw bribery. I'll show you how to make them scared. All of these changes together represented a significant overhaul of everything that Rockstar had managed to accomplish with three. And yet, without so much as breaking a sweat, the studio managed to implement them all in just under a year and released Grand Theft Auto Vice City in October of 2002 to an even greater reception than its predecessor. Players couldn't believe how much deeper and more polished of an experience it was compared to GTA 3. Nor could they get enough of all the ways that it stylishly rooted itself in its era of choice. From its soundtrack, which featured an immaculate collection of 80s bops, to its much wider selection of boats and aerial vehicles, which turned exploring the game's environment into a much more varied and glitzy affair. Vice City turned the hedonism of the 80s into an art form, and many players' favorite game in the series. Despite all of this, the game would also be no less of a stranger to controversy than GTA 3, with dozens of disgruntled voices once again coming out of the woodwork to blame society's ills on it following its release. This time around, many of these voices would take particular issue with a line of dialogue in the game that, when grossly taken out of context, seemed to encourage violence and racism against Haitian Americans. While Rockstar felt the accusation to be unwarranted, it also had no interest in escalating the situation any further, and eventually replaced the line with a less inciting one, though not before numerous protesters took to the streets to express their discontent. Okay. また車泥棒か違う潜入任務だここは都会じゃねえんだからよここはジャングルだ As 2003 rolled around, Grand Theft Auto's presence could be felt all over the video game industry. New series like The Getaway and True Crime were rushing to try and emulate Rockstar's Robbers and Cops sandbox with their own unique twists, while older properties like Jack and Daxter were packing their worlds with as many aspects of its design as they could muster. Grand Theft Auto itself, however, was missing in action. After knocking it out of the park twice in a row with GTA 3 and Vice City, Rockstar's staff knew that whatever they did next would need to significantly up the ante if they wanted to go three for three. It was important that they remained on the bleeding edge and got their games out the door as quickly as they could. But if they wanted to craft an experience that would live up to the increasingly lofty standards they kept setting for themselves, they were going to need a little extra time. For this reason, Rockstar decided to give itself an additional year of development in order to ensure its next title would dwarf its previous outings. Instead of being confined to a single metropolis, players would be able to explore a three-city state made up of Los Santos, San Fierro, and Las Venturas, stand-ins for Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Las Vegas, respectively. Shops, gyms, and restaurants would allow players to granularly improve their abilities as well as customize their appearance. And its plot, in addition to serving up the series' usual criminal hijinks, would break boundaries by casting players as an African-American protagonist named Carl C.J. Johnson as well as probe more deeply into America's racial tensions than any of its prior outings had attempted. At the same time, Rockstar also decided to use San Andreas' development to pull back on certain aspects of its prior titles that it felt would no longer be a good fit for the series. For example, where GTA 3 and Vice City had prominently featured the voice talents of actors like Michael Madsen and Ray Liotta, it was decided that San Andreas would primarily use lesser-known actors and keep its number of A-list stars to a minimum. At the time, Rockstar felt that with all of the clout it had amassed, it would be more interesting going forward if it attempted to discover and elevate new talented voices instead of relying on celebrities to boost their esteem. However, with each subsequent entry in the series, its desire to keep the profile of its game's cast low would also come to reflect its visionary shifting ambitions. Speaking to GameSpot in 2011, Dan Hauser would explain how during the development of the series' earlier titles, they were aspiring to create something akin to a movie or TV show one could control, which in turn made the appearance of actors famous for their movie or TV roles make sense. But after San Andreas, 
They felt that the series should try and angle itself to be something less easily grasped, making the presence of celebrities feel out of place. Whether one noticed it or not, this comparative lack of celebrity voice talent hardly proved a deal-breaker. Upon its release in October of 2004, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas demolished expectations, selling even more strongly than either of its predecessors, and earning itself a mountain of praise from critics for all of its new changes and features, though not everyone was happy with them. Some felt that the hugeness of its world was to its detriment and made getting from point A to point B an exercise in tedium. Others felt that many of the new ways it attempted to deepen one's engagement with this world ultimately felt superfluous and unpolished. But even those who came down hard on it, and weren't named Jack Thompson, agreed that it was still a tremendous experience. Little did Rockstar know that an even more tremendous catastrophe was about to befall it. Last year it was revealed that there was an explicit sexual scene hidden inside a video game called Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. It turned out that was one of the best-selling games of the year. This content was not disclosed to the industry's rating board, so the game did not receive the adults only rating that it deserved. In the months leading up to San Andreas's release, Sam Hauser had tried to make a huge push with Rockstar to include adult-oriented content in the game, advocating for the inclusion of all manner of sexual acts and paraphernalia never before seen in a product of its caliber. More than just wanting to shock and awe, Sam felt it important that Rockstar's products continuously push the medium forward and challenged what it could be. But after extensively researching how far they could push things, it became apparent that if most of this content wasn't cut, San Andreas would be given an adults-only rating and be unable to hit store shelves at most retailers. As a result, any adult-oriented content that had already made it into the game was either removed wholesale or buried deep in its code. The latter became the fate of Hot Coffee, a mini-game in which players perform sexual intercourse with CJ's girlfriend. Crude and awkwardly animated, Hot Coffee remained deep within San Andreas's recesses until 2005, when Patrick Wildenburg, a Dutch software engineer active in Grand Theft Auto's modding community, released a modification for San Andreas's PC release that made it available for all to experience. The backlash to Hot Coffee's existence was swift. San Andreas was slapped with an adults-only rating by the Entertainment Software Rating Board. Jack Thompson and his ilk embarked on a campaign of condemnation that succeeded in roping in the support of concerned individuals all over America, including Senator Hillary Clinton. And the Federal Trade Commission pulled Rockstar into court in order to investigate whether it had intentionally tried to undermine the rating board by having hot coffee in the game. While Rockstar eventually managed to pull through these crises and release San Andreas without its offending content, the entire incident left the Housers and many within the company physically and emotionally drained. For a brief moment, the entire empire that they had built up seemed like it was about to come crashing down, and with it, the livelihood of the hundreds of employees that were invested in its future. But they had a future now, and that future was incredibly bright because after working within the confines of the PlayStation 2 and Xbox's hardware for over half a decade, Rockstar was going to be able to transition to their far more powerful successors, and its brain trust had tremendous ideas of how it was going to use this power. Hey, hey, hey. so there he is, huh? Hey. <laughs> so listen, Tony. I know you did a good thing first, and I know you've been lying low for a long time, so I want you to take it easy for a while, huh? Before these ideas would be laid bare before the world, however, gamers would be treated to Grand Theft Auto Liberty City Stories on the PlayStation Portable in 2005. Prior to Liberty City Stories, Grand Theft Auto had long tried to make its mark in the realm of handheld gaming. The year before, a Game Boy Advance adaptation of the series titled Grand Theft Auto Advance had graced Nintendo's platform on the same day as San Andreas's release. And before that, portable adaptations of Grand Theft Auto 1 and 2 had both rolled out for the Game Boy Color in 1999 and 2000, respectively. Yet, Liberty City Stories, which had been developed collaboratively by Rockstar Leeds and Rockstar North, would be its first handheld release to feature an open world in the style of the series' PlayStation 2 trilogy, as well as garner considerable praise. 
Critics found its compressed version of its titular metropolis to be just as rife with detail and things to do as its console counterpart, with many agreeing that its main story and assortment of side missions more than stood their own. An inconsistent frame rate, as well as a few control issues stemming from the PlayStation Portable's lack of a second analog stick, ensured that not all fell in love with it. But those who did found it to be a great experience and an incredible technological showcase of the Portable's capabilities. Eager to make the most of its foothold within the Portable's library, Rockstar would follow up Liberty City Stories with Vice City Stories the next year. Outside of some mechanical improvements and a new empire building system that tasked players with operating various businesses on property taken over from enemy gangs, Vice City Stories didn't do much to reinvent the wheel of its predecessor, but most didn't complain. Safe as it may have felt, the core experience it offered still made for a highly enjoyable trip. And by the time of its release, Rockstar had already let the world know that the series' next great leap forward was on its way. Welcome to America. Stop shooting people, you maniac! Leave my people alone! I ain't asking you, I'm telling you, do this! We are pleased to announce that the next iteration of this franchise, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, will be coming exclusively to PlayStation 2 this fall. We look forward with great anticipation to hearing more about this product in the months to come. Through the early 2000s, Grand Theft Auto had been as synonymous with the PlayStation 2 as its first party releases. While all of its mainline entries eventually arrived on the Xbox and PC, the series remained as much a part of Sony's brand identity as titles like Jack or Ratchet and & Clank and helped push more units of the company's second console into homes than almost any other series. At the dawn of the seventh console generation, this relationship changed. Eager to score a one-up on its direct competitor, Microsoft partnered with Rockstar to officially reveal Grand Theft Auto IV to the world at its 2006 E3 press conference, as well as receive a few other benefits. Instead of staggering it out to Microsoft's home consoles years later, Rockstar would now release GTA IV day and date on both a PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 and develop exclusive expansions to the game's main story for the latter. All the while this shift was happening, GTA 4 was shaping up within Rockstar's offices to be one of the company's biggest and most personal projects yet. After doing a full tour of America's east and west coast during the previous console generation, the Housers had decided that it was high time they return back to Liberty City and imbue it with as much detail as the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3's hardware would allow for. In the decade since they'd taken Take-Two's offer to move to New York, their love for the Big Apple had only intensified, and they wanted this intensity to reflect proportionally in the game. Likewise, in crafting its lead character, they both agreed that it would be most interesting if they created someone who reflected their own experiences as outsiders coming to the land of opportunity, such as how protagonist Niko Bellic, a brooding Serbian looking to start a new life in Liberty City, came into being. In addition to all of this, it was decided that GTA 4 would feature an online multiplayer mode. While the series had experimented several times in the past with various types of multiplayer suites, Rockstar's plans for what it wanted to do with GTA 4s were a significant step above any of its past efforts. Rather than just confine players to small arenas to play conventional multiplayer game types together, like Capture the Flag or Races, the company wanted to allow players to both do that and explore the game's single-player map together in squads of people, in order to preserve the game's sense of spontaneity and freedom when with others. To accommodate for all of this, the studio would let go of the RenderWare engine, which it had been using since the days of GTA 3 to build its open worlds, and adopt its proprietary Rockstar Advanced Game Engine, which it first demonstrated in 2006 with the release of Rockstar Games Presents Table Tennis. Many staff from Rockstar's various international subsidiaries, which it had been steadily growing since its acquisition of Rockstar Canada in 1999, were also brought on to ease the amount of labor necessary. 
and before the world knew it, Grand Theft Auto 4 was out on store shelves in April of 2008. Sales figures once again smashed expectations, and reviews from all corners of the industry showered it in praise, with a few caveats. Compared to GTA 3, Vice City, and San Andreas, GTA 4's narrative was thematically far somber in tone, delving into Nico's tormented psyche and his relationships with his family and friends with greater fervor, greater than anything that had previously been done with CJ or Versetti. <laughs> War is where the young and stupid are tricked by the old and bitter into killing each other. I was very young and very angry. Maybe that is no excuse. Roman? Roman! Ah! Are you sleeping, you fat no, fuck? No Come on! What's the time? Shit. I've got to get the cab back. It's on the shift. This didn't make the game's open world, which offered a tremendously more fleshed out sandbox to play around in than anything before it, any less deep or rewarding but it did provide the entire experience with a layer of seriousness that was difficult to fully tune out, something that didn't sit well with all that played it. At the end of the day, however, there was no dispute whether or not one welcomed GTA 4's darker tone. The sheer flexibility of the world this tone permeated was still a tremendous achievement and another sizable step forward for the series. And this time around, the controversies that followed this step forward were much less pronounced than normal. While the likes of Jack Thompson still attempted to turn minds against its squalor, they ultimately failed to inspire nearly the same level of vitriol that had followed the series' prior titles and retreated relatively quickly. It took 75 years and countless billions of dollars to train our soldiers to kill. Today, 60 bucks buys your kid the same thing. Whatever happened to Pong? Following this, 4's first expansion, The Lost and the Damned, would arrive in February of the following year. Set concurrently to Nico's actions in GTA 4 proper, The Damned followed Johnny Clevitz, the vice president of a motorcycle club chapter, on a quest to keep his gang running while weaving his way through an increasingly complicated web of heist and deception. Critical opinions on the expansion would be as strong as ever, and would continue to be as strong when his follow-up, The Ballad of Gay Tony, would arrive eight months later. Also set concurrently to the events of GTA 4, Gay Tony offered a more comical experience, following Luis Fernando Lopez, the bodyguard of nightclub owner Anthony Tony Prince, on a series of over-the-top missions to scrape Prince out of debt. Coming off of the emotional seriousness of The Damned, Gay Tony offered a solid palate cleanser, and more importantly, an even solider conclusion to Four's overarching story. I know, franchise is not the way to go. The, the club is all about the people. Fuck the people! Fuck them all! We pat your dick and piss all over them! Despite Microsoft's earlier intentions to keep them exclusive to the Xbox 360, both The Lost and The Damned and The Ballad of Gay Tony would go on to be made available on the PlayStation 3 and PC in 2010. Watching the two expansions become platform agnostic took many by surprise, though most agreed it was far from the most surprising turn the series had taken in recent memory. For during the same period of time that GTA 4's expansions were being put out, Rockstar had released Grand Theft Auto Chinatown Wars exclusively on the Nintendo DS. Set within a top-down rendition of Liberty City reminiscent of its series' first two entries, Chinatown Wars impressed fans of the series with both how deftly it took advantage of this viewpoint and its platform's unique hardware. Whether used to display emails with important mission information or a hot-wiring minigame when jacking into certain cars, players found the ways Chinatown Wars utilized the touchscreen on the DS to be consistently creative and smart, and only rarely gimmicky. Unfortunately, Chinatown Wars also fell well short of its sales expectations following its release, prompting Rockstar to bring it over to the PlayStation Portable later in the year. Many assumed that Nintendo's more casual player base had been repulsed by Chinatown Wars' emphasis on violence, or if not that, by how different it was in appearance from the series' most well-known entries. However, in an interview later in the year with MTV, Nintendo's then-Vice President of Sales and Marketing, Cammie Dunaway, would blame the game's lackluster performance on the lack of marketing behind it, 
pointing out how other mature-oriented titles had succeeded in breaking even on Nintendo's consoles in the past after being endowed with the right amount of support. Whatever the exact reason for it, Chinatown War's underperformance would prove the last performance of any sort that the Grand Theft Auto series would have on a Nintendo platform, with Rockstar refusing to release any other entry in the series on the House of Mario's consoles ever again afterwards. A little over a month after 4's expansions arrived on the PlayStation 3 and PC, Rockstar fans were treated to a fantastic, yet decidedly different open-world experience by way of Red Dead Redemption. Developed primarily by Rockstar San Diego, Redemption presented players with a sandbox bursting with the nuance and level of detail of Grand Theft Auto, yet set within the world and emotional framework of the Wild West. What it lacked in terms of cars and modern technology, it more than made up for in incredibly strong writing, as well as one of the most complex animal ecosystems that gamers had ever interacted with, establishing itself almost overnight as a classic, and its brand as a second pillar upon which Rockstar could rest when not working on its main juggernaut. The stakes were now higher than ever for the next Grand Theft Auto to deliver, and the wait to see how it would do was growing longer and longer by the day. Yet as usual, Rockstar had good reasons for taking its time, for not only had the developments of Red Dead Redemption and Max Payne 3 taken much longer than anyone had anticipated, but its plans of where it wanted to take Grand Theft Auto V had stretched its resources to their absolute limit. Like with all of the series' prior entries, it had been agreed from the get-go that V would set as many new benchmarks for the open-world genre as it could, with Rockstar's brain trust deciding early on that they would try to deliver the most lifelike menagerie of people, cars, and chaos that they could muster in a reimagined version of San Andreas's Los Santos. But this time around, instead of only allowing players to experience this chaos from a single protagonist's perspective, GTA V would allow them to take control of three, Michael, Trevor, and Franklin, whose stories would interconnect as they completed missions. Where you at, man? Your house is empty. Oh, hey, I had to kind of lay low for a while. Previously, Rockstar had drawn up plans to allow several playable characters in San Andreas, only to nix them early on due to the technical limitations around which Andreas's world needed to be built. Following this, the introduction of the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360's superior hardware during GTA 4's development had made it possible to revive this idea. But it was only after watching the intertwining narratives of GTA 4's single-player expansions go on to be well-received by the community that Rockstar became motivated to attempt it again with GTA 5. The company hoped that this feature would be able to further ease the process of exploring their sandbox, as well as take its narrative to heights previously unseen by being able to switch between three different characters that could be located in vastly different parts of Los Santos. One would theoretically be able to easily explore the city without having to spend a long time in transit to their next destination. And when embroiled in the game's more story-intensive segments, this switching would likewise allow one to gain a more comprehensive view on what's going on than if one was confined to a single character's viewpoint. To bring these aspirations to life, Rockstar would go on to pump more money into GTA V's production than any of its prior projects, as well as rope every single one of its subsidiaries into working on it. Both this and its enthusiastic marketing campaign eventually resulted in it becoming the most expensive game ever made at the time of its development, a statistic that was quickly offset by its sales, which proceeded to shatter records around the world effortlessly following its release in September of 2013. Players were enamored with how much more detail its world contained compared to its predecessors, finding the level of accuracy with which it succeeded in recreating Los Angeles to be impeccable and the immersiveness of the sandbox it provided almost unrivaled. There was almost no dispute. GTA V was, like 3 and 4 before it, another quantum leap forward for its genre in terms of the freedom it allowed for. By comparison, critical opinions were more divided when it came to its cast of characters. Most generally agreed that the gameplay opportunities that switching between them resulted in were great, as were the many bombastic set pieces they often found themselves forced into. But there was no consensus on whether Trevor, the trio's loose cannon, was brilliant or childish. And most tended to agree that for all the exciting hijinks it took them through, 
Their shared narrative ultimately didn't spin as interesting of a yarn as it could have. Well, he didn't make it. You sure, man? Because he might be a... Oh! Oh! No, he didn't make it. Are you funny, huh, motherfucker? In the end, these criticisms would ultimately do little to stop most players from logging plenty of hours exploring Los Santos by themselves. But in time, they would end up spending countless more exploring it alongside others in GTA V's online multiplayer mode, Grand Theft Auto Online. Build as a more fleshed out take on GTA IV's multiplayer set in a continuously evolving version of Los Santos, Online initially found itself mired in mixed reviews upon its release. Critics mostly agreed that while the promise of what it could eventually become was tantalizing, its execution was lacking. Glitches and technical issues were everywhere, and the experience one was treated with for muscling through them, while not without its bright spots, was repetitive and unrewarding. Unwilling to let online live on in this state, Rockstar thereafter worked hard over the following years to improve its offerings, fleshing out missions or features that weren't living up to their standards, as well as providing a plethora of new modes and events tailored to almost every possible proclivity players might have. And eventually, after a tremendous amount of tinkering, the company managed to wholly transform online from an interesting failure into one of the video game industry's most consistently popular titles. Unfortunately, as a partial consequence of all the work that went into getting online to this state, Rockstar would quietly shelve plans to release expansions to GTA V's single-player campaign, despite the latter being heavily teased and anticipated for years by Rockstar and its fans respectively. In a 2017 interview with Game Informer, Rockstar's Imran Sanwar would explain how after working themselves dry developing GTA V's main campaign for two different console generations, and then drier still making its multiplayer component into an attractive commodity, the team reached a breaking point and decided to leave its story where it concluded. Everyone still believed in the value of single-player expansions and all of the unique narrative and mechanical possibilities that they alone allow for. They just no longer felt like they were necessary or possible with GTA V. Nós não podemos anunciar que o GTA 6 está sendo desenvolvido. Vai ser o presente de Natal. Eu pensei que fosse sair em 1º de outubro de 2020. It's anyone's guess at this point what Grand Theft Auto 6 will look like, let alone when it will materialize. Speaking with GQ magazine ahead of Red Dead Redemption 2's launch, Dan Hauser expressed being thankful that he wasn't releasing six in the Western title stead, explaining that he was at a loss as to how his development studio should tackle it. In an era where American politics and culture move at a mile a minute, there seemed to him to be nary an opportunity to satirize either without having said satire become immediately outdated. And for a series as laser focused on lampooning American society as Grand Theft Auto, this represented a sizable creative problem. In the end, however, it's unquestionable that regardless of what happens next in America, the series will continue well into the future, and that Rockstar might need to clip Grand Theft Auto Online's wings prematurely when this future comes. The studio currently has nothing to lose by continuing to support its multiplayer juggernaut, but if Online is still as popular as it is now when its successor launches, it may very well end up cannibalizing the latter's offerings. Compared to Hot Coffee and all of the other politically charged controversies that Rockstar was forced to deal with on its journey to stardom, this predicament that this series is currently facing is almost benign. But it's a predicament all the same, one that the studio's brightest minds will need to skirt around carefully going forward, lest they want to risk becoming victims of their own incredible success. Thank you for watching our video. Our documentaries are crowdfunded and made possible by your continued support for us. We'd like to thank by name the generous patrons who have pledged to our highest reward tier. Caleb Shishkifich, EmuMovies.com, Jefferson Dos Santos Oliveira, Maktoum Said Al Maktoum, Mohamed Kayed, T. 
Timur Tourist Bake Off. If you enjoy our content, please consider subscribing to our channel and joining us on Patreon. Thank you.